Hello everybody and welcome to this video where we are going to talk about a message I got from Ethan McGuire. And it is about, if you remember on the AMA thing that happened, I think like last week or something, somebody asked a question about, um, I don't even remember how the actual question went. You could go back and watch it if you're interested, but it was like, what, like why I think metrical poetry isn't popular anymore. And it's something that like we've talked about a lot. I thought the responses that I seem to get from that made it seem like maybe I never went into it as much as I thought I did, or maybe it's been so long that a lot of people who are like new to the channel haven't gone back that deep in my million video archive. So I wanted to read some of the stuff Ethan said, cause it's really good. Um, he says, I like your answer in your recent AMA live about metrical poetry. Even the conservative formalist poet and critic Dana Gioia, Gioia, oh, fuck it, um, said this, which agrees with what you said. Hip hop was born from the common people's need for poetry, folk music, and poetic narratives in their lives. If I go back to 1975, when I was leaving Harvard, I was told by the world experts in poetry that rhyme and meter were dead. Narrative was dead in poetry. The intellectuals in the United States took poetry away from common people, and the common people reinvented it. The greatest one of these was Cool Herc, in the South Bronx, who invented what we now think of as rap and hip hop. Within about 10 years, it went from non-existent to being the most widely purchased form of popular music. We saw in our own lifetime something akin to Homer, the reinvention of popular oral poetry. That is fucking insane. That is just, oh, chef's kiss on that, dude. And then Ethan goes on and he says, um, and you are one of the only people I hear talk about the modernist poetry in those terms, but you're absolutely right. Something a lot of today's academic poets, both in academic free verse and in formal poetry, won't admit is that Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot along with others, but those two especially, were seeking explicitly to bring an aristocratic character back to poetry after what they saw as the populist takeover of poetry by such figures as Longfellow and Whitman. And that's always been my bitch, is that especially Eliot saw what Whitman did and is like, no, like I, I want this for me and my friends not for you people. And the thing about Pound that drives me crazy, and, and I said a little bit about this in this message to him, but I've tried to stay away from Pound because of his controversial uh, fascist bullshit that he got tangled up in. Like, I don't know enough about him personally to know um, how that went and what his like feelings were, but I know... Um, if it wasn't blatant, it was at least sympathizing with fascism. And, um, because of that, I've kind of stayed away from him on this channel. But the thing about Pound that also drives me absolutely crazy is that he went from a view of poetry being simple and easy to where anyone could understand it and that's how you write good poetry, to being the most obscure, vague motherfucker in the world in the cantos. So I have very little compassion for Mr. Pound. This is Ethan's comment continued. People will say Pound and Eliot continued Whitman's work from freeing poetry from metrical constraints, but they were actually trying to do something quite different, really. 
something much more akin to what you say they were doing. Yeah, they were trying to make poetry like a cool kids club that you could only be a part of if you are accepted. And the only way you would be accepted is if you are of a certain type of person. It's fucking bullshit. And it's been that way since. It's fucking been that way since. And I will say this because I have tried to bend over backwards to be accommodating and acceptable and whatever to these fucking academic motherfuckers and their shitty fucking journals that they think are so fucking precious. I've gone out of my way to not only try to work with these people, but to actually befriend these people. Like, outside of online. Like, go to where these people are and try to, like, meet them on their own ground. And it, they want nothing to fucking do with it. There's a woman who lives in this building who is a relatively famous, um, what do you call those poets? I don't think it's a language poet. Like that big move in the 80s to where everything was super fucking like linguistic and formal. I can't remember the name of that movement, but she's one of those people. And like she was all about telling me about her interactions with Ginsburg. Like she was very, very excited to tell me all about that. I give her my book and she never fucking talks to me again. I've run into her a couple times and she says, oh, I wanted to talk to you. And it's like, bitch, you know where I live. You have my phone number. I'm not hard to find. I'm the size of the fucking elevator. You can't miss me. You know? But I'm not going to fucking play this fucking bullshit game of where people's work actually matters nil. It's all about who you know, who you're friends with, who you're nice to, who likes you, who was your mentor, and all this other shit. Where you went to school, um, who has published you, um, what editors do you have numbers in your phone of. Just a bunch of bullshit. Fuck these people. You're, you have peaked. All of you fucking people, okay, that we're talking about right here. I, I'm not going to throw Ethan under here. We'll, we'll just say I'm talking about these people here. This is the highest you're ever going to get. You have peaked. When you die, no one will remember you. Because you're alive now and no one remembers you. Nobody knows who the fuck you are. And all you want is that prestige. And it's never going to come for you. You want to know why? Because you are a, another fucking, like, mimeographed fucking copy of the same fucking bullshit that's been going on for a hundred fucking years that no one cared about then. And you think you are going to be something that someone gives a damn about? It ain't going to happen. Nobody knows who you are. Nobody cares. The second you stop posting every three seconds on whatever social media you have, whenever you stop going to whatever stupid fucking coffee shop, fucking jerk off session that you and your academic poet friends go to, the second you stop going to that, you will be forgotten. Nobody fucking cares. I, on the other hand, and I'm not trying to fucking be a braggadocious motherfucker right now, but there's no way for me to say this without it sounding like this, okay? On my worst fucking month, more people read me than read you. On my worst fucking month. I have people who fucking read my shit naked, take pictures of it, and send it to me. That's what poetry's supposed to fucking do. Back in the old days, that's what poets did. Poets wrote words that made motherfuckers drop their fucking pants. Okay? I'm not doing this to brag. I'm doing this to show you how insignificant your bullshit is. And I'm not doing this to try to be like, 
oh, look at how like hurt he is. He's got to he's got to puff up. No, I'm trying to illustrate a point. If rappers and hip hop artists and even fucking musicians and rock stars and the whole thing are the poets of today. Look at them. They are the ones getting tail. They're the ones making the money. They're the ones with all the bling and shit. They're the ones with all the alcohol and drug problems and awesome things like that. Okay? Not you. Okay? I don't know how to say this. I don't want to romanticize the evils of poetry and like the evils of addiction and things like that. But hear me out. There was a reason why all that time ago the most like amazing immortal poets were the ones that had certain problems and had certain problems. Very few of the academic poets have any problems. The biggest problem they have is like um no, they, they don't have problems. They, they get grants and they get um, teaching gigs and they pontificate. Yeah. I think um, academic poets' biggest problem is trying to come up with new and better ways to complain about all the other poets and like your hip hop stars and your rock stars and all this other trash. The descendants of Elliot, you are insignificant. Technology has made you like the, the argument I made in the live stream was that once musical instruments became readily available and accessible to all different income levels of people. And as soon as radio became accessible to all different incomes of people, this whole idea of poetry being like metrical poetry being the lyrical form of like, if you want to rhyme, if you want to sing, you can do that with music now. You could do that with a guitar. And all you have to do is buy a guitar one time. You don't have to keep buying paper and keep buying pens, typewriters, and everything to make it that and like sending stuff out. You just have your guitar and you go and you play. That's it. It made it easy because the masses matter. The ivory tower fucks don't. You all, the fucking grandchildren of Elliot, the grandchildren of Pound, all of you fucks, you think your shit don't stink. It's non-existent. Nobody cares. This woman who lives in this building, I can't even fucking remember her name. And she's like a big deal. She was at that thing with Terrence, whatever his fucking name is. She read at that thing too that happened down in Venice. I don't know. So basically, like, there are poets who are immortal, there are poets who are not. And then there are poets who are living fucking legends who become immortal. And I'm not trying to fucking suck my own dick here, but that's who I am, okay? So if you want to see, if you want to look at a poet who is going to be read over the next hundred years, hello, how are you doing? Welcome to my studio apartment. Choke on a bag of dicks, okay? While you wrestle with your posy, with your prestige. Because all the prestige in the world will not help you if nobody knows who the fuck you are. Wow. That got deep, guys. So back to Ethan's message. <laughs> oh my fucking God. To add one more aspect to the above... Eventually, Pound decided he would eventually hijack part of Whitman's project. And when he did, he wrote this poem about it. Oh my gosh. A pact. 
Oh, and then I was like, this poem looks really weird how it's written. What the fuck? Um, and we went back and forth, but it was because uh, WhatsApp. You guys know what I'm talking about. So now I will read to you the poem called A Pact by Ezra Pound. I make truce with you, Walt Whitman. I have detested you long enough. I came to you as a grown child who had a pig-headed father. I am old enough now to make friends. It was you that broke the new wood. Now is a time for carving. We have one sap and one root. Let there be commerce between us. This poem is in the public domain. Honestly, I still don't like the way he's saying what he said here. Because he's saying it like... Like, yes, I was a bastard for thinking this stuff about you. But, fine, we're, we'll be friends now. It's not like, dude, I was so fucking wrong, you were right, I... Like, worship at your feet. Place that in my... And that's all Whitman ever wanted. All Whitman ever wanted was to put it in your thing. Jesus Christ, man. Jesus Christ, man. So anyway, um, I appreciate this poem. And it's actually one of the... And if this is later pound, like, I appreciate it even more. Because there was a long period there where he was so up his own ass with his words, I don't even think he knew what the fuck he was talking about. Have you read the fucking Cantos? Fuck my face, dude. Um, but anyway, Ethan, thank you so much for that. And I love it when you guys send me stuff so I can do stuff like this and then turn it into a rant about why I'm awesome and everyone else sucks. I didn't mean to do that. That just happened. Oh, my God. How do you guys put up with me? I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's how you put up with me. Maybe that's the thing. Maybe that's the charm. Possibly, possibly, possibly. So we got all sorts of amazing stuff coming, especially Fire Station, which we'll be talking about shortly here. So um, I love you guys. Very nice, very nice. Type hard. We got some merch coming soon. Oh, and I forgot to tell you guys. P.A. Oh my God, look. Poetic Anarchy, that's funny. Who knew? Who knew that if I double bird you guys, it says Poetic Anarchy. Type hard, Poetic Anarchy. Oh my God. Wow, that took way too many years to find out that that's what that did. Oh shit, oh shit, son. Okay, so um, the Discord is back up and it's only four Anarchy Crew members. Any tier, if you join down below, you get in on the daily live streams. You get in, um, and today on the daily live stream, we found out why I wear underwear. It was, it was riveting. It was riveting, guys. Oh, and also why I hate men. That happened too. So yeah, if you join, you get all the Poetic Anarchy courses. There were over 100 videos in that. You get all the live streams that we've been doing for the last however many years plus the daily coffee live streams. And these are only going to get better as I travel, okay? It's going to be awesome, all right? So join down below, um, and we are also planning a retreat, a writer's retreat for next year in some far-off country on a beautiful beach, drinking coconuts, living like fucking poets should. Okay, so if you want in on that, you have to join and get in. So w when we're talking about where we're going, when are we going to go and all this other shit, we could all talk about it. Okay, so it's going to be awesome. Poetic Anarchy for life. Wait, no, no, no. Asshole. That's my Vonnegut asshole tattoo. All right. So type hard, guys, and I will talk to you all later.